الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحابه ومن تبيهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين تنات إن شاء الله we look at this topic the Quran in fact when we talk about the Quran we are talking about the most prestigious book that one can think of the Quran a book for reading only in fact all of us as Muslims we love reciting the Quran we love reading the Quran we love memorizing the Quran and we love seeing the Quran in front of us well the Quran in itself is it just for reading and I'm sure most of us do read the Quran we read it in Arabic we recite it in Arabic and we even try to read it in a language that we understand because we love reading the Quran this is a wonderful thing it's a very good habit to be developed to read the Quran but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran to answer this question. It says in Surah Al-Baqarah, the very second chapter in the Quran, Fihi hudallil muttaqeen, that in the Quran, it's a guidance for the God-fearing people. It's a guidance for those who are meticulous about everything they should be doing in this life. It's a guidance for those people who are very scrupulous in doing the right thing, and to abstain from that which is not right. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that the Quran is the guidance for humankind, for all beings, Muslims, non-Muslims. It's a guidance for everyone. If you want to go to Jannah, if you want to understand life, if you want to understand the life after this life, then we need to delve into the Qur'an, because the Qur'an provides us with that information. So today, inshallah, we're going to look at a few things in the Qur'an. What is it that the Qur'an provides for us, besides just the guidance for mankind, or guidance for God-fearing people? The Qur'an is a bit more than that, because as I said, it's a precious book. It's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a revealed book. And in a revealed book, we should have contents that are beneficial for everybody, for the entire globe. It's information that we can all benefit from. Allah subhanahu wa tells us in the Quran, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Do they travel in the land? فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعَمَلْ أَبَصَارِ وَلَكِنْ this is amazing ayah in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the intellect of an individual because the Quran in its fact is there to capture the intellect of individuals is there to capture the intellect of the intellectuals I'm also the layman it encompasses all the different categories that you can think about so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling to light have they traveled in the land? Do they move about in the land that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created? And observing people, there are people that have got qulub, they've got hearts. And with these hearts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them, they reason with the heart. They apply logic. They apply common sense. Sometimes one may want to ask that how can the heart in itself relate to intelligence? How can the heart relate to common sense or logic? A well, little do we know that the heart in itself has got brain stems, just like we have in the brain of every human being. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that it's got the capacity to reason. It's got the capacity to use part of our intelligence. It's got the capacity that contains the logic. These are the different faculties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. He's talking about how some people, they have got hearts, but they're not using it in the proper way. They're not using it in the way to understand the Quran or to get information from the Quran or to use the Quran as the GPS or to use the Quran as a compass or to use the Quran as a guidance as part of their life. 
Very little do people think of that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing those people who have got these faculties, but they're not using it appropriately. That they have got hearts that they reason with. And they have got ears that they hear with. It is not the sights that are blinded. But it's the hearts that are in the chest of these people that are blinded. In fact, they hear, but they still didn't hear. They see, but they still didn't see. They have hearts to reason, but they still didn't reason because they haven't used these faculties appropriately. That it's the hearts that are blinded because they hear the good news. They hear the right information, but they still haven't observed it. They have seen the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they still haven't digested it. They have got hearts to reason, but they still haven't reasoned appropriately to understand who is the creator. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing them in this ayah. In other words, if you look at it from a different angle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that we need to employ and to use these faculties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And if we use them, then we can get the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. Then we can get that guidance. A key word here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses, يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا means that they are reasoning with their hearts. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us intellect. And we need to use that intellect the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would expect from us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Qur'an and he has given us intellect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Qur'an and has given us intellect. So the Sharia is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The intellect is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reasoning is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Common sense is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can they contradict each other? Of course they can't, and they would not. And this is what scholars have looked at, like Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says in a book, ta'arud al aqli wa He said we should avoid contradiction between the intellect, common sense and reasoning, and that of the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because they are not contradictory. They do not oppose each other. It's the same thing you've been saying where most of the leading scholars in the world, from the time the Quran was revealed to now, the same thing have been said about the Imam al Haramain, the two, or the Imam of the two sacred houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al Ghazali said a similar thing, and Imam Fakhruddin al Razi, they have said a similar thing in terms of the Sharia and that of common sense and reasoning. Meaning, it's not possible that you can have contradiction between that of reasoning and common sense or that of the Sharia. It is virtually impossible. And that is why it is said, or Imam Al Ghazali, he says, that that intellect or reasoning is the sharia internally and the sharia in itself is the intellect externally meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the sharia and has given us intellect and common sense so we use our common sense we use our intellect to understand the quran we use the Qur'an to bring out our logic and our common sense, is vice versa. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us here in the Qur'an, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Have they not traveled throughout the land? فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا So their hearts may reason. They can go out in the land, look at 
the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to look at some of the things that can be appealing to their hearts. Their ears may listen. They may use their hearts to reason. Their ears to listen. And indeed, it's not the eyes that are blind, but it is the heart and the chest that go blind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that and give us some sort of insight so that you can understand the importance of the Quran. Because thinking about the Quran, pondering, pondering on the Quran, that would bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That would give us more understanding in understanding the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each ayah is miraculous in the Quran. That's what makes it the Quran. How could we know that? If we just think about just reading Quran only, and we don't think about understanding the Quran, and we don't think about comprehending what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, or we don't try to even implement and to share what the Quran is talking about. Foremost, if we don't ponder and contemplate in it, we will not understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. He reminds us in Surah Al-Rum, وَمِنْ آيَتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتِ لِلْعَالِيِينَ it's an amazing ayah in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to think, to think and ponder on the Quran, to ponder the Quran. Someone will say, you don't ponder on the Quran, but you ponder the Quran, meaning the Quran is in your memory and you're pondering on the Quran itself. It's within you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, from among the signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your languages and colors, different races, different languages that we have, different tongues that we have. These are all from the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna fi dhalika la ayati lil alameen. That indeed, these are signs for people who have knowledge. People who have sound knowledge, they would observe these signs. They would observe al-sinatikum. Ikhtilafu al-sinatikum wa al-wanikum. Inna fi dhalika la ayati lil alameen. In fact, this would show the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when ponder in. The ayati lil alimeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in the next ayah. Wa min ayatihi from among the signs. Manamukum bil layli wa nahar. Is your sleeping by night. Wa nahar and during the day. Wa abtidaukum min fadli. Seeking the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us about the signs again. It's among the signs is your sleep by night and by day for rest, seeking the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as you're seeking his bounty, meaning that you go out and you work and you earn. That indeed, in it are signs for people who listen. What is amazing about this ayah is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the night, he ends the ayah by saying, Inna fi thalika yisma'oon. He talks about hearing. When he talks about night and he wants us to ponder upon the signs at night, he talks about hearing. Because at night, you hear better than during the day. During the day, you see better. So use the faculty of sight during the day. But at night, use the faculty of hearing. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about sleep and mentions about the night, he's talking about using that faculty of hearing. And from among the signs is you're sleeping by night. And to seek the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To go out and earn. To seek your livelihood. That indeed in that are signs for people who listen. They use their faculty and they listen. They listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. They even listen to the natural phenomena because they want to understand this natural phenomena in life. As to what is this word about? Why are we having so different sounds? What are the natural sounds during the night? Why should we be listening to those? Because we want to understand the signs and manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And continuing to the next ayah, 
from among the signs, يُرِيكُمُ الْبَرْقَ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا And one of the signs is that he shows you lightning, inspiring you with hope and fear. He instills in you hope and fear. خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا يُرِيكُمُ الْبَرْقَ He shows you lightning. خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا As fair and hope. وَيَنَزِّلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَيُحِيبِهِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down rain from the sky, reviving the earth after its death. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَعْقِلُونَ That indeed, in that are signs for people who have reason, for people who have common sense, for people who are intellectuals, for people who use their intelligence. لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ You see the song يَعْقِلُونَ is very special in the Qur'an. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about يَعْقِلُونَ it comes in the word عَقْلُ It literally means to restrain oneself, to abstain from something. That's what it literally means. In the days of the Arabs, you will find that they used to use the iqal. The iqal was actually the rope they used to tie the head gear with. They would take that out and they would use it to tie the camel when they returned from a journey because they want to restrain the camel. And that rope, that piece of rope was called the iqal, not the modernized one that they have now. That's a bit of beautification. You will find they use that because it's a form of restraint, restraint for the animal so the animal would not escape. That is iqal. That is implicit in the meaning of the word يَعْقِلُونَ Because when someone develops their knowledge and they develop their, their intelligence, they develop a very high standard of resilience. They develop a high standard to restrain themselves from doing things. For example, if someone knows that fire burns, would he put his hand into the fire itself? No, he would not. Because his intelligence tells him that, or his intellect tells him, that if he puts his hand into the fire, he will get burned. So he wouldn't do so. If he does, thinking that he's got some magical power and he's not going to be burned, well, then something is seriously wrong with him because he's going to get burned. So he's going to abstain from doing that. What makes him abstaining from that? Because of the knowledge that he has got and he has, he has employed that knowledge. He acted on that knowledge. It's just not theoretical. So he decided to abstain from it. Likewise, when we know about staying away from temptation, we should. When we know that we need to stay away from jealousy, we should. When we need to stay away from envy, we should. When we need to stay away from backbiting, we should. When we think about all the vices that surround us, we need to abstain from them because they've got the knowledge and we understand how serious it could be or the serious impl implication it could have, not only on ourselves, but on other people, even to our friends and family. We need to stay away from that. And when we have that level of resilience, that we can stay away from these things, then we come under this category, that these are people who can abstain themselves from those things because they have used their reasoning, they have used their common sense. Where do we get it from? It's all from the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is instilling this idea that we need to think, we need to ponder and contemplate. This word in itself, Ya'qilun, is used in the Qur'an at least 49 times, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly is telling us that we need to think about the Qur'an. How do we think? We need to understand it. How can you think if you don't understand it? We can only think when we understand the Qur'an. That is why the Qur'an is not there only to be read. Of course, when you read it, you get some lessons, but it's not there for that. If you want to get the guidance, how are we going to get the guidance if we don't understand it? If you want to get benefit from the Quran, how is it we're going to get the benefit if you don't understand what it says? In the days of the Sahaba, it's narrated by Abi Abdul Rahman al Sulabi. He says, when the ayat were revealed to the Prophet, وسلم, there were four things they were involved in. One, the first thing they would memorize it. They would memorize these ayat. Second thing, they would try to understand. They would understand these ayat before they proceed. They would try to understand the contents. They ensure to understand the contents of each ayat before they move on. Thirdly, 
then they would act upon it. They would implement it. They would ensure that what they understood, they have implemented. And the last one, they would be sharing it to other people. They would be teaching other people what they have learned of the Quran. So the very first thing, they would memorize it. And then they would understand it. They would ensure they understand the ayah. Then they would implement it. And then they would share it with others. That's how we maximize the blessings of the Quran. That's how we maximize the benefits of the Quran. That's how we get the greatest benefits from the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is the last revelation. It is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the book in which we have found the guidance to take us not successfully in this world only, but also gives us success in the akhirah. How do we get that? We have to understand the Quran. So it's good to read the Quran, but we must understand the Quran. And then we need to implement it. What's the purpose of understanding the Quran and not implementing it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes reference to this in Surah Al-Jum'ah. So, مَثَلِ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلَ طَوْرَىٰ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا أَسْفَارَىٰ it's, it's an amazing ayah in the Quran, but it's a very, very serious ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that the people who have received the Torah and they didn't act upon the Torah is like a donkey carrying books. Very serious statement. Having the Quran, understanding it and not implementing it, that it means that we are like that example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Because what's the purpose of a donkey carrying a library of books? It's not going to be of any benefit. It's going to benefit the donkey. We want benefit from the Quran. We want the maximum benefits from the Quran. We want to gain from the Quran. We want it to stimulate our thinking process. We want it to help us with our understanding. And we can only do so when we try to understand the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is important for us to do so. It's amazing to know that even the Muslims that study the Quran and they understand exactly what's in the Quran or how important the Quran is. You don't even talk about how miraculous the Quran is, even though they don't believe in it. You will find an author like, you know, Bosworth Smith. You know, he says, it was the one miracle claimed by Muhammad, his standing miracle he called it. And a miracle indeed it is. He's telling us that the Quran is miraculous. Can you believe that? Although he didn't believe in it. Hartwig Herschel, he said in his book, New Research, he said the Quran is unapproachable as regards convincing power, eloquence, and even composition. The Quran is unapproachable as regards convincing power, eloquence, and even composition. So if we just think about just reading the Quran, are not understanding it, then it's not going to be of great benefit to us. It's not going to benefit us in this world, and it's not going to benefit us in the akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us an understanding so you can change that concept that we got in our mind if we think just reading the Quran is sufficient, and that's the only thing we should be doing. H.A.R. Give in a book called Muhammadanism in 1953, he talks about the similar thing. He said, well then, if the Quran were his own composition, other men, other men could rival it. Let them produce 10 verses like it. And if they could not, and in bracket, and it is obvious that they could not, then let them accept the Quran as an outstanding evidential miracle. H.A.R. Gibb, 1953, in his book, Muhammadanism. You know, those days used to call Muslims Muhammadans. So... <laughs> They think that a Muhammadan is someone who actually follow Muhammad. In fact, it doesn't have that meaning. It implies that you're worshiping Muhammad. Of course, Muslims will not do that. But that's the kind of name they were given to Muslims. And most of those Orientalists, in fact, they were making statements like that. And you can go on to many other statements from the Muslim scholars that they have studied the Quran. They know the Quran. Not only that they think about reading the Quran, but they read the Quran and they understood it. But it didn't go on the third step to implement what the Qur'an has said. Similar thing with Basanta Kumar Bose in a book called Muhammadanism in 1931. He says, so there has been no opportunity for any forgery or pious fraud in the Qur'an. 
which distinguishes it from almost all other important religious literature or religious works of ancient times. It's exceedingly strange that this illiterate man should have composed the best book in the language. Listen to Kumar Bose. Can you imagine that, 1931, telling us that this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has produced the best book in the language. You know, the Arabs today, when they have uh, differences in language or any aspect of grammar, you know, they refer back to the Quran and look at the Quran for evidence to see how they can correct the mistakes that they have because the Arabic in the Quran is the standard of the Arabic language in itself. It supersedes that even of the ancient Arabic, which was the best that ever existed. And then the Quran comes into place, it supersedes the best that they had. That is why the Quran is the standard of the Arabic language, is the standard of the Arabic grammar, is the standard in the whole Islamic work that supersedes any other literature that existed. That's the beauty of the Quran. How can we know that? We cannot know that by just reading the Quran. We need to study the Quran. We need to spend time to study and understand the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could be pleased with us. That when we know the Quran, we try to implement it. And when we implement it, we share it with others. These are the most important things that we need to think about. How should it be read? As I said, to be read with understanding. To be read with pondering. Contemplating. Implementing and sharing. That's what the Qur'an is about. And we talked about what did the Sahaba used to do? They would memorize it first. Then they would understand its contents. And then they would implement what they have learned. And then they would teach others. Do we skip any of these steps? Are we enthusiastic to embark on these steps? Or we just want to stay away from these steps? In fact, we should not skip any of these steps. We should do exactly what the Sahaba had done because they were the closest to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's the way, that's the approach they had with the Quran. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala give us a similar approach that we can maximize our efforts and we can have the maximum benefits from the Quran, the book of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, the final revelation. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ لِي وَلَكُمْ